Fourth of July, everybody. It's Fourth of July weekend, and you're in the house of the Lord. Come on. Even my barber shop didn't have people in it. Even my barber shop was empty because uh, people were away. They're playing hooky on Fourth of July, but not you guys. You guys are faithful. You showed up. You came here. You've got a purpose, and you've got a plan, and God has something to share with you today. So I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit, and hopefully we're going to get into some um, some teaching that you guys are going to help me with, but I wanted to talk to you about the key of David. It's something that stood out uh, to me from our teaching, uh, our time with the uh, men. We're reading through Revelation, and in Revelation chapter 3, it talks about the Holy One who has the key of David, um, the one who is true and holy, has the key of David, and I thought, well, you know, what's he doing with the key of David? You know what I mean? Like, why doesn't he have the key of, like, Alan? You know? <laughs> why doesn't he have, like, the, the key of Mary or the key of Don or the key of Carrie or the key of Lenora? You know what I mean? Why is it the key of David? What's so important about this guy that he's got his key that the Holy One has his key up in there, right? So what's so interesting, what's so important about the life of David? And so we're going to get into that today. But I want to read to you out of uh, Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading in the New King James Version. And um, if you still have the scriptures from last week, those are pretty much the ones I'm going to use this week. All right. So Jim says no. So here we go. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13, reading in the New King James Version. And it says this, and to the angel of Philadelphia write, these are the things says he who is holy, who is he who is true, who has the key of David. He opens, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works and I see I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but they lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and uh, to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to, per to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell in the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have ears to hear today? What the Spirit says to the churches. The churches. Now, Jesus said an interesting statement. He said, I have sheep that you know not of. They are not in this fold, but they are in another fold. It makes me think that Jesus could have prophetically been speaking about the church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is currently in modern day Turkey. And um, he wrote, uh, uh, John wrote this, uh, these letters on behalf of Jesus to the seven churches of uh, Revelation, right? The seven churches. So uh, Sardis and, and uh, Thyatira and, and Philadelphia and all of these seven churches are up in, in Greece and, and in Turkey and in those regions that are outside of Jerusalem. So these are uh, Jews. These are believers. These are Christians that have accepted the message of Jesus and are living in lands that are outside of the promised land. They are outside of Jerusalem. They are outside of Israel. They are in other countries. And so uh, these seven 
letters are written to people who maybe would be considered uh, Gentiles because they were possibly converted outside. And so when we read these letters, we can also look and see, well, is there something that the Lord is saying to us? Now, the scripture says that it is alive and active. Do you read it that way? Like it was, oh yeah, 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 this was just happening historically to these people back here. But is it alive and active today to you? Does it speak to you today? Because the end phrase right there says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And so this can't just be a historical letter that was written in history, but it must be alive and written to us today. And that's what I hope to, to do is to bring it into today. If the shoe fits, wear it. If you received a prophetic word or you received a word from the Lord that had nothing to do with you, if, if somebody came to you and said, you know, uh, the Lord is really delivering you from uh, the ancestral slavery that you endured, that your family endured. And you're like, uh, my family was never enslaved. That word doesn't apply to me. That would be a false prophecy. Right? Because they're speaking of things that don't fit. So when, when John is writing these letters on behalf of Jesus, he is writing things that Jesus is speaking straight to the heart of a people that have experienced these things. And each thing is dripping with revelation. And each thing is dripping with purpose because it means something to those people. Today during the message, there may be things that don't apply to you. That's okay. Don't wear that. But if the shoe fits, wear it. Let it, let it, let it land. Let it hit the mark. Let it open up some things for you. So it says here that the one who is true, who is holy, who has the key of David. There is one who is true and one who is holy. He is set apart. He is not, he is altogether other. He is separated out from any power or authority that you relate to here on the earth. I'm not talking about rulers. I'm not talking about emperors. I'm not talking about um, uh, people, kings. I'm talking about the one who is holy and the one who is true. That's the first thing that he wants to establish. I'm talking about the one who speaks the truth and is altogether separate. He holds the key of David. Um, let's, let's do an exercise this morning. Let's talk about what keys represent. I'm going to come up here. Sorry, Jim. Okay, keys. Really, it said key. What do we know key? Yes, Bama. Open. Access. Unlocks. Locks. What else? Secures. I heard that. Important point. I didn't understand that one. What does it do? Can you read that? Keep safe. What was the one? There was something over here that was said that I didn't understand. Keep safe. What else? It what? Key, like a key, like, like, yeah, necessary clue. Re 
responsibility. Oh. Authority, ownership. Control ignites. Are you looking up your thesaurus over there, Mr. Mike? <laughs> Mike is a walking thesaurus. When he has to say something, he has five words on how to say it, you know. And so he's over there. I see the light of his phone, you know, uh, going. Oh, taking notes, taking notes. Key, key, key. I have the key of David, okay? I have, um, I have the ability to open and to access and to unlock and to lock. I have the ability to secure. I have the ability to keep safe. I've got control. The one who is true and holy, he's got control over some stuff. I don't know how you feel out of control right now, but he needed to say to the church of Philadelphia, I'm the one who's got control here. I don't know whose control you've been under, but I've got control. I am able to start something that nobody can, can uh, deny me. I have the ability to make a, an important uh, point. I have the responsibility, I have the authority, the key of David. It unlocks, it unlocks truth. It unlocks, it gives access. Because I can. Of. Uh, that's okay, I don't need it until the end. Uh, belongs to of comes from of Belongs to, possessed by, all right, what's that, part of, a word using to define a word. Set of four. Set. Part. Part. Huh? Part of. Part of. It's part of. It 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 belongs to. It's a part of. Okay, stuck on important over there, I think. Jurisdiction. Okay, right there, that says jurisdiction. Huh? A piece of the pie. Lineage. Wow. Lineage. Okay, so this true and holy one has, possesses, has jurisdiction, comes from this person named David. What does the name David mean? Beloved. 
favored. David, who is David? King. Worship. What else? Warrior. Am I spelling warrior right? A? Y'all are weird in America. <laughs> Leader. Oh, sh shepherd. Music. Okay, music. Uh, worship. Er. What's that? Obedience. What's that? Adulterer. <laughs> Had to go there. Genuine. We got that? He was a father. What's that? Repenter. There it is. He was a poet. He was what? Davidic kingdom. Prince. Lover of God. And after God's own humble. What else was David? Oh, courageous. Legacy. Seeker? Leader. I've got leader. King. Ruler. Son. He was the youngest. Hello. Shepherd, we've got chosen. Oh, he was a anointed. Humble, we've got underdog. Under. Heart of the Father. Giant Slayer, we've got blessed, blessed. Fearless. No, I'm just making sure you guys stay engaged. What'd you say, Adam? Descendant of Adam.
Yeah. Um, author. He was a type of the Christ, right? Okay. So, Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, I am the one and true and holy who has the access and authority, the ability to unlock, the ability to secure that which belongs to or was possessed by or had the heart of or is of the lineage of David who was beloved king, worshiper, uh, shepherd, father, obedient, giant slayer, uh, repenter, musician, sinner, adulterer, chosen, faithful, legacy, son of Adam, humble, king. I have his keys. He was the key of the kingdom. David was a replacement. Maybe not a replacement, but he was chosen by God. Um, to any of you that have ever felt overlooked, Samuel comes to the family of Jesse, and Jesse parades all of his sons before uh, the prophet, because the prophet says, one of your sons is going to be anointed king. All of them were rejected, and, and, and Samuel says, do you have any other? Yeah, just this scrawny little Dude, he's out watching the sheep, you know, but I don't think he would really amount to anything, you know. Well, bring him in. And sure enough, the Lord says, this is the one that I choose. And so today, the Lord wants to dismiss off of you any title that you have placed where the Lord says, well, he can't use me. I'm just a nobody. He has the keys of the nobody. He has the keys belonging to nobody. He has the king belonging, he has the keys belonging to one who didn't amount to anything to be brought before the prophet. God says, that's the one that I pick. Why? Because God does not look on the outside, God looks on the inside. God looks at the heart. If any of you have ever desired to be propped up, and if any of you are pretending to be okay, and to look good, and to look the part, but you're not genuinely the part, God says, I want no part in that. I've got the keys of the one who is real. I've got the keys of the one who knows who I am. I've got the keys of the one who was intimate with me, who talked with me, who worked out his salvation, who sinned and got it wrong and didn't pretend like he would ever made a mistake, but he came before me and he asked me to forgive him and I forgave him. I've got his keys. I've got the keys of the guy who won over the entire nation to him himself because he was merciful, because he was bold, because he was courageous, because he wasn't a coward, because when he showed up and everybody else was bowing and was cowtailing to the giant of the Philistines for 40 days, he shows up at a delivery boy and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that dares defy the armies of my God. Have you all forgotten who he is? I know who he is. You think I'm crazy and I just spend time with the sheep. But let me tell you, when I'm out there and one of my, one of my sheep, one of my worthless sheep get away and, uh, and snatched up by a wolf or by a bear or by a lion... I go down and I grab that lion and I say, you spit that thing out of your mouth right now, so help me God, I'll put you down. That's whose keys he's got. Somebody who's bold. Somebody who's going to do something. Somebody that doesn't just like to have it dangle on his key ring and be like, ah, oh, look at me and how good I am. Somebody who's actually used the key to open some things that nobody can shut and to close some things that nobody can open. Somebody who's actually walking it out. That's whose keys he's got. David is a type of the, of, of the Messiah because, uh, well, it was prophesied. And, and, and actually, when Bartimaeus calls out to him and many others, they called him son of David. 
Matthew starts out by uh, starting with David and the genealogy. Um, they trace it, both genealogies trace Jesus back through the lineage of David. He will be of the line of David, of the tribe of, the, uh, uh, of Judah, of the lion of Judah, of the tribe and descendant of David. The, the Messiah will be a descendant of David who will sit upon the throne forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. And upon his shoulders shall rest the what? The government. And it shall not be taken from him. It shall endure forever. And so um, we have this testimony that Jesus holds the key of David. A key means one who has authority or rule over. One who is in control or in charge of the place. David went over the hearts of the people. You remember after he slayed Goliath that they came in and they came in singing songs. Saul has slayed his thousands, but David has slayed his ten thousands, right? And so David won over the hearts of the people. Jesus wins over your heart. Jesus is speaking to a church of a people that... He wanted to know, I'm here to win over your heart. The one who is true, the one who is holy and has the key of David. In early uh, Christianity, Christians were Jews. They, there was no division. They mingled, they, they, they met together, they prayed together, uh, they worshiped together. And uh, throughout the years, as they began to profess Christ and the, risen, uh, the resurrection of Christ, uh, there began to be a separation and a, a, a delineation. But um, early on, they were a part of the synagogue. They were a part of the church or the, 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 the synagogue in the region. And so that's where they would meet. The synagogue was your life source. Even to this day, many Jews, when they need a loan, they don't go down to Bank of America. They go to the synagogue. And they get themselves a loan for their house. The, uh, so much of your life flow depends on your relating to the synagogue. Now, most of the known world was ruled by Rome at the, in those days. And certainly this area where Philadelphia was, was also ruled by Rome. And it was ruled by, C, uh, ruled by Caesar and by uh, Domitian and by Nero and by many other uh, emperors that that demanded total allegiance to Rome. You must serve Rome. Now, there was one distinction that Rome had in that if they had an organized religion when they conquered a land, they would allow them to keep their religion, but they still had to pay homage to Caesar. But there was a clause that was given to them that they could... Um, have the freedom to worship their God and to, and to operate as long as they were a recognized religion. So Judaism was a recognized religion. But what happened is that when Christianity began to break away from Judaism, it wasn't a recognized sect. And so it would suffer persecution from the Romans because they were a new uh, religion and they were a threat to the emperor. So when they were locked out of the synagogue, when they were put out of the synagogue, then their names were expunged from the book that excluded them from needing to pay homage to Caesar, and they were free game to be persecuted and to be um, uh, targeted for um, unfair practices. And they could no longer participate in the free, free function and business of the synagogue. And so they were pushed aside. So this is what it says. He who holds the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. 
What Jesus was specifically saying to this group of people is that I know how you have been treated and how you have been put out to the synagogue. You can imagine them coming up to the synagogue uh, and, and, and knocking on the door and them opening a little peephole and looking and saying, oh, it's Don and Mary. They're believers. Nope, you can't come in here. No, no, no. And the door was shut. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant that I made with David. I am the one and true. I am the true authority in the land. And if you are looking for anybody to relate to, it would want to be me. And I hold the key. And the door that I open, nobody can shut. And the door that I shut, nobody can open. I'm not playing religious games here. I'm here after your heart. And so if anybody is sick and tired of playing religious games, this letter is to you. And you want to listen to what he has said. He says, it's interesting to me because he says this. Um, I see that I have set before you an open door that no one can shut, and you have little strength. And you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews, but they are not, but a lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Um, David was despised and rejected. He says, uh, my mother and my father forsook me, but you have never forsaken me. Jesus is a representation, I mean, David is a representation of those that have been forsaken by the most beloved people in their life. And he says, don't, don't wear that as an identity because I will cause those who say that they are in the right but are found to be in the wrong. Those who are playing the game, those that are of the synagogue of Satan, there's a double statement here because Jews don't really believe in a Satan with pitchforks and, and, and horns. The way that, that uh, Jews see Satan is that Satan is on God's payroll and that he does his bidding. There's biblical uh, proof for that. In Job, it says, have you considered Leviathan? Have you considered, he does my bidding, he does my work. So there's, there's uh, room to incorporate that. But to call them of the synagogue of Satan is saying you belong to a group of people that don't even know what you believe. You, you believe um, exactly the opposite of what you profess that you believe. You look the part, but you're not the part. We could end right there, and we could all go home. Because we're living in a day where it demands that we not just look Christian, but that we be Christian. And there's got to be something behind that, not just something that we're against or we'll die. There's got to be something that we're for. Jesus says, I will cause those that say they are mine but are not, I'll cause them to come and to fall at your, I'll make them to worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. It reminds me of what he said to Joseph when Joseph's brothers also denied him and threw him in a pit and sold him off into slavery. And years later, God made his brothers to come and to bow at his feet and to worship him. His dream came true. God is true to his word. And here's he saying, I'm the same God of Joseph. I'm the same God that was able to watch over all that happened in his life. And his brothers indeed came back. I will cause that to happen again. Don't lose hope. Don't lose your strength. Be strengthened in the Lord. Don't give up your belief. Stay vigilant. I've commanded you to persevere. If you want to be from any church in the churches of 
Revelation, you want to be from the church of Philadelphia because it's the only one that God doesn't rebuke. If we were to put a chart up here and say, you know, you go ahead and put, you know, what church you want to belong to, all of you should put your gold star on Philadelphia because it's the church that doesn't get rebuked by God but is loved by God but is told they have done a good job, that they have been faithful. And see, here's what was going on is in the year uh, AD 17, uh, there was a great earthquake that happened in that region, and everything came toppling down. It was so devastating that the emperor Domitian uh, actually gave them a five years reprieve from giving tribute to Rome so that they could rebuild. They were hoping for a little bit more help from them, but instead what they got is the uh, Domitian said, hey, and listen, uh, I need you guys to uproot all of your guys' vineyards because it's so good that it's competing with ours. So I want you to uproot all of yours so that ours can rise to the top. And so by doing so, he broke the backbone of their economy in that region. And so it was devastated and it was lying desolate and it had suffered, you know, this tremendous shaking. So when God writes his letter to them and he says, hold fast in verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one be able to take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will make him a pillar. I will make him a secure place. I will make him to be one who bears weight, one who can be relied upon, one who doesn't crumble under pressure. He's coming to a people who have seen everything that has been devastated. Everything was knocked down. And he's saying, I'm coming. The one who is true and holy is coming to rebuild your life in a place where everything shakes. But I'm going to keep you. And I'm going to cause you. And, and listen, and when I set you up, you're never going to have to go out and not be welcomed back in. You're always in. There's a mindset that I believe the Lord wants to give us today, that I believe David had. That when, when, when it says, I have the key of David, who was David? David was one who believed that God could do anything. He said, with my God, I can run through troops and I can leap over walls. Well, that's an interesting statement to, to, uh, for, for a guy who has keys that can unlock anything. <laughs> Why do you need to leap over a wall if you got a key that's going to unlock doors that no man can shut and close doors that no man can open? Because sometimes you got to go out and you got to conquer some things. Some of you need to repossess some things that you've lost. You have, you have lost the key to it. You have lost the power to it. You have lost the access to it. You no longer control your life. Your life is spinning out of control because an enemy has come in and has stolen that. But with my God, you can run through troops and you can leap over a wall and you can reclaim what has been taken from you and you can take it back. I believe that there is an anointing for you right now to take your place back and to cause God to make you a pillar in the house of God. You're not going to be one that falls by the wayside and, 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 and people look at and go, wow, wasn't that, you know, how sad that that happened. No, you're going to be standing. You're going to be standing for him. He'll, he'll put his weight upon you. David was courageous. David was a, a giant slayer. I believe that God wants to give you back that giant slaying anointing, that there are some things in your life that has intimidated you and have held you at bay, but God wants to give you the courage to go and to face your giants and to slay your giants in this season. This is not a time to shrink back. This is a time for you to know who your God is. I'm going to tell you something. There was, there, there's a secret that I believe that God is releasing to us today and in this hour and in this, in this season right now. That if you will consecrate yourself to the Lord, seek his face, he'll give you a word that will bring your breakthrough in, in, in the days to come. 
God said to Joshua, tell the people to consecrate themselves today and tomorrow. Um, and on the third day, I'm going to do great and un un unusual things in your midst. So consecrate yourselves today, for tomorrow I'm going to do great things in your midst. He told Moses, he said, have the people call a fast and have them consecrate themselves before the Lord. Because I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to bring them uh, revelation that they're going to need to be able to break through in the days ahead. You need to have revelation for the days that are coming ahead. Uh, God, an angel appeared to... Uh, uh, an angel appeared to Paul and said, uh, Paul, hey, listen, I know that the ship that you're on, I know that you tried to convince them to not set out and to set sail, but they set sail anyways. But here's what the Lord says. Everything in the ship is going to be lost, but not one soul on the ship is going to be lost. If you will follow what I say. And so he had the word of the Lord. The storm still came. The destruction still came. The devastation still came. But not one of them lost their life. They all arrived safely. Do you follow what I'm saying? Is that the word of the Lord comes and secures you for what you are about to go through. I don't believe that, that uh, the word of the Lord is, is coming to cause you to circumvent things that are coming. But he even said to this church, he said, if you will be faithful, I will cause you to not suffer the things that are coming upon the whole world. Special clause. There's a special clause over your life. You need to know it experientially that there's a special clause over your life. You need to know that. When the people of Israel marched around Jericho, God told them to shut their mouth. And to not talk. Right? But they had the word of the Lord. That at his command. They would release a shout. And those walls would come tumbling down. And then they had to think about it. For a long while. Do I believe that? Or do I not believe that? Do I believe that? Or do I not believe that? Do I believe that? Or do I not believe that? It says also through the testimony of Rahab that Jerusalem was tightly shut up and that the people inside of it were melting because of fear. So there was fear on the outside and there was fear on the inside. The people of God were afraid and the people inside were afraid. But the people of God had the word of the Lord and they kept moving. And the people that were inside did not have the word of the Lord and they, they were shut up, and they were consumed and melting in fear. Fear will cause you to either melt or to move. Um, I, I, I was talking with somebody this week, and they said, you know, I thank God for the things that God put me in and the situations that he put me in because otherwise I would not have been motivated to do the things that I am doing now. I would have put them off. I would have said, ah, I can wait till another day. It can be something else. Fear is a great impulse and a great motivator, but it's a terrible taskmaster. You never want to be ruled by fear. Fear can, can give you that, that push to say, go and do it. And then you, you walk in the fear of the Lord, but you do not melt in the fear of the Lord. David had the fear of the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord to rescue him. He had many enemies all around him, and he said, God, put your eye upon me. Guide me with your eye. Lead me. Uh, lead me not into temptation, right, but deliver me from evil because many are my foes that are around me. David was surrounded by enemies. Jesus was surrounded by enemies, but they both overcame their enemies. And he is saying something to you through this message today that you also are surrounded by enemies, but by the power and the strength and the ability of God, you too have the ability to overcome all of your enemies. That, that you will do something that is supernatural that will have a natural impact. They believe the word of the Lord. 
So this, this phrase, the key of David, only appears twice in Scripture. Once in Revelation and once in Isaiah 22, verse uh, 22. And it says this. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 20. Isaiah 22, verse 20. Then it shall come in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah. Um, and I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. And I will commit your responsibility into his hand. And he shall be a father to his inhabitant, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah. The key of David, the key of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. So he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. And I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place. And he will become a glorious throne to his father's house. This is Isaiah prophesying that the manager of the house of Jerusalem, uh, his name was uh, Shebna, that he was going to be replaced by another guy named Eliakim. Eliakim is the son of Hilkiah. So Shebna means vigor. Shebna means vigor. And what it said there in, in this passage is that Shebna was building for himself a sepulcher. He was building for himself a tomb as somebody of great importance would build for himself to be remembered. As if he was some big shot and everybody should come when he dies and pay homage to him. And God says, I am so sick of you. I'm removing you and I'm going to throw you into a large com uh, country where nobody's going to remember you. He looked the part, but he wasn't. He looked the part. Saul looked the part, but he wasn't. And he replaced him with another. Jesus is the second Adam. The first Adam, sin, son of God, sin. The second Adam is Jesus, and he comes unbecoming. And so they've rejected Jesus, but the one that was rejected became the chief cornerstone for all that God wanted to build. And so don't look on the outward appearances of things because God's not interested on the outward appearance. Don't beat yourself into dead works that aren't going to do anything, but actually do something. And so God says, I'm going to strip the authority from Shebna, and I'm going to put it on uh, Eliakim. And Eliakim is going to wear your belt, and, he, and I'm going to strengthen him. And I'm going to cause him to rule and cause him to have great authority. And what he shuts, no man can open. And what he opens, no man can shut. And I'm going to give him the authority of the key of the house of David shall be on his shoulder. In those days, the key... Um, were so large that you would wear it on your shoulder. It was a large, you know, sometimes it could be two feet long, and it had many different, um, you know, appendages to it to be able to unlock things. And so the one who had the ability to be able to unlock the storehouse, he wore the key on his shoulder to represent, I have authority to give access to things that you need. Eliakim, the name Eliakim means God raises or God set up. So he says, I'm going to remove the one whose name is Vigor, the one who works by the sweat of his brow, the one who toils, the one who labors in his flesh. I'm going to remove him and I'm going to raise up one who's, who is called God raises up. He is godlike and he is a mighty one. That's what his name means. Godlike and mighty. His name means ram, as in sacrificial ram. His name means pillar or do doorpost. Didn't we read in Revelation that he said that those that overcame, he would make a pillar and he would write his name upon him? Isn't he saying But by making him a pillar, he's going to make him like him? He's going to make, he's going to put his essence in him. In essence, he's going to be one with him. 
I'm going to remove the one who uh, brought slavery and burden upon you, and I'm going to raise up one who is godlike, who is like a ram, who is like a doorpost, and whose blood is upon the doorpost. And he is the son of Hil uh, Hilkiah, which means my portion is Jehovah. The Jah um, part of that is shortened, and it's the proper name of God. It means the existent one, the one who is able to remain. So I'm going to bring the son of the existent one who is able to remain, who will be a sacrifice for you, and I will put upon him the key of David. And here in Revelation, all the way in the end, we see he's the one. The one who holds that key is Jesus. So he's affirming the church that is out there and has been pushed aside and has been cast aside and has been locked out and has been told, you are not a part of, of God. He's saying, you are absolutely a part of my house. And I'm going to put my name and I'm going to open doors that nobody can shut. And you endure right now the hardship that you are enduring. I know that there was a great shaking that has come to you. But I'm going to cause you to stand firm and erect. And I'm going to uh, give you the strength for the day that is to come. David represents to us this champion, this king, this, this king who had the heart of God. He possessed it. I'm going to say a phrase that's going to sound very shocking to you, and it's meant to shock us. But if you have not experienced the Bible, the Bible is hearsay to you. It's just somebody else's story. Until you possess it and you make it your own. You don't really have it. You just have stories about it. But I believe that we're coming into a day of where God is demanding that you have a portion from him. And God is removing from you the, the yoke and the bondage of works that amount to nothing. He says, I'm not interested in your works. I want your heart. The people wanted a king. And so they picked Saul because he looked good on the outside. But I said, I've rejected him, and I've chosen another one who is a man, has a heart after my own heart. And so today we're going to receive communion as we close. And, and I asked Willie, um, this is a this is a upbeat song for communion. What we're going to do, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. So we're going to have to be very strategic about how we take our communion. <laughs> we don't want to spill juice everywhere. But um, those who are going to help us serve communion, if you would uh, get the stations ready for us. David didn't just know about God. He knew God. He possessed him. And you know, isn't it cool that at the end, Jesus says, I hold the key of the house that we built together of the guy who joined hearts with me. The guy who wasn't perfect, but his heart was always after me. This song says, when the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David dance, and I will pray like David prayed. My hope and my desire for us today is that there'll be something that shifts inside of us of where we become those that are possessed by God. That 
our lives become a testament to others that they would say, well, why, why does he say I have the keys of Randall and I have the keys of Carrie and I have the keys of Mary and I have the keys of Lenore and I have the keys of Zach because he actually did something. I want to say this. We were reading in uh, Ezra chapter 1. And there's a genealogy in the, the record of people that came back and their names are recorded in there. And I said to Carrie, I said, all of those names would have meant diddly squat if they hadn't done something when they got there. Let me say it like this. I write many journals, but those journals mean diddly squat unless I actually accomplish something. And then all of a sudden people are like, we want the journals of that guy that accomplished that one thing. Live your life so that your journals matter. Live your life so that you accomplish what he says to do. So that people will say, you know what? They pointed me. They unlocked me. There was something about their lives that touched me in a powerful way and changed me. Jesus is the only one that can change us. Jesus is the only one that can unlock those doors. But he says, I have loved you and I'm coming to you. And I have not put you out, but I have given you access. So come freely. Let the spirit hear what the, let, let those who have ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And so I say to you, let your ears hear what the Spirit is saying. Let's receive communion now in this atmosphere. Let's receive communion in this atmosphere. Come on. There's stations back there, up here. Come grab. Yeah.